Our brains are undoubtedly our most valuable asset, but they are also vulnerable to both external and internal interference. Let's examine a few ideas. What influences interfere with the brain? How do we interfere with our own cognition? Is there a way to influence the brain from external, spiritual, psychic, and mystic sources? Who might be using your brain when you're not? What kind of chemo-emotional triggers do you indulge in from various entertainment sources? Do you watch TV or news media that trigger anger, fear, and aggression? Do you watch programs that reveal secrets and hidden truths? Do these make you feel good? This essay explores vulnerabilities of the brain and how they affect our perception. Material you should be familiar with before this can be most effective include being familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect, also by some variation of the uh, baloney detection kit. There are links for both of those things down below, along with a link to my second essay, where I describe the remarkable extents the brain will go to to protect you from life-altering perceptions. If you've not seen that, it may be informative to other content that will build upon this essay. These issues may be wrapped into influences like haunting phenomena, psychic experiences, and variations of what people call being zapped by a Bigfoot or by demons or by aliens. It's important to understand these vulnerabilities because they're not only how we mislead ourselves, but they're exploited by those among us who want to influence what we think about, what we spend our money on, and even how we think. But it can't all be just in our heads, can it? Of course it's happening inside your head. Why should that mean that it's not real? The brain controls the body, and while there are vectors to affect it that I will discuss below, we measure activity in the brain that seems to represent everything that we think and feel. If we exist apart from the brain and body, the connection we have through the brain is quite strong, evidenced in part by that observation. So is there anything left for the paranormal? Well, let's explore what we know first. Science cannot understand what it cannot measure, nor should it be made to. Science is the crucible in which we reduce everything we can measure into the properties that define it. Science must never be made to explain one unknown with another unknown. Our ability to imagine beyond the bounds of science is how we push those boundaries further with each new discovery. But we are vulnerable to imagining things that may not truly be as we would like them to be. We can imagine some ineffable part of us that goes on after the body and brain die. We may even be correct in that thinking. But perhaps it is just a comforting conceit, for it cannot be measured with available technology today. That crucible remains empty when we try to burn away everything that we understand there. We imagine angels inspiring us to good and demons drawing us to evil. But we cannot measure these things. They may, in fact, exist, but the crucible of science remains empty when we try to measure what is there. We do not need angels to be good. We do not need demons to be hateful and destructive. They may simply be comforting projections that allow us to externalize the actions we cannot fathom of ourselves or of others. I present here just the surface of what we have learned, the volume of knowledge is far more deep than these teasers can describe. And if you're truly interested, then you should dig into these ideas yourself and explore them. There's a lot of material out there. So can it all just be in our heads? Unfortunately, the answer seems to be yes. It actually can. The empty crucible says so. However, we may simply not have the right formula yet to find something left after the furnace as we analyze things now. 
our understanding and our technology will continue to change and we will learn how to measure and understand new things. This essay will be useful for understanding both elements of scientific thinking and also for understanding more metaphysical and paranormal aspects of our thinking. Carl Sagan used to say that science is not so much a body of knowledge as it is a way of thinking. We all have three brains in our brain. Two of them are very primitive, and they operate on chemistry to provide lightning-fast responses to aid in our survival from a more primal time in our past. Long ago, they were programmed by what is like us and what is different, what will kill us, what will not, what we can relax around and what we need to be wary of. They're responsible for sensations making us alert to danger by introducing chemicals that induce anxiety and fear. They serve the same functions today, but they are programmed differently in our early development. They're specific to our family and our locality, and they're programmed to help us determine what is good and bad, what is right and wrong, what is acceptable and what is not. Our need for the fight-or-flight response is far less than it once was, and that kind of response now takes place for radically different reasons within the society that we have created. The important thing to remember is that these chemical brains work far more quickly than the cognitive brain where more sophisticated thinking can take place. People who are easily provoked respond strongly to these chemical stimuli. The saying, think before you act, is among the simplest wisdom regarding keeping control over these brains. These are the parts of the brain about which I spoke in my second video, where the vast pharmaceutical capabilities of the brain can manipulate your emotional state and even alter your capacity to store memory of certain kinds of events. The next two paragraphs are likely to trigger elements of those chemical brains. Even after I tell you this, you're still likely to respond to it. Observe these sensations should they happen. Learn one step in being able to overcome these primal, chemo-emotional states of mind. They will make you feel good when you accomplish something, or when you think you have. These sensations are used by people who think they are intuitive or empathic to decide if they like something or someone. They make you feel good if you believe you've discovered some revealed truth or secret knowledge, like revelation of conspiracies. They will help you relax when you're safe and with trusted friends. Other chemicals will make you feel bad when something threatens your cherished beliefs, maybe like just a few moments ago. These are primal fear and aggression sensations. These sensations are used by people who like to think they're intuitive or empathic to decide if their guides are warning them about something or about someone. They will make you feel bad or angry when your boundaries are challenged or when your cherished beliefs are threatened. They will make you alert and even aggressive when you feel threatened. These chemo-emotional states happen very much faster than the cognitive mind works. Many people allow these primal brains to drive most of the time, almost literally setting the monkey at the wheel and letting the cognitive brain just ride along in whatever way they have programmed it. A psychological experiment was conducted on a university campus where the Wi-Fi for part of a library was deactivated for part of the day. During times before, during, and after the Wi-Fi was off, there were people to take a survey of those leaving the library. The subjects were asked a series of questions about their experience that day in the library, and some were asked to provide a blood sample for endocrine analysis. Among those surveyed, the students leaving because the Wi-Fi was not working, also showed blood chemistry consistent with fear and agitation. They were experiencing a visceral fight-or-flight response, altering their body chemistry for immediate danger, because the Wi-Fi wasn't working. And not all of them had urgent papers to work on. In fact, 
Most were simply deprived of some entertainment time rather than research or homework time. Yet their primitive brain was making them feel endangered. Your brain has a bewildering range of pharmacological capacity, and in decades long past we discovered elements of these pharmaceutical factories, such as the pineal gland. I'll pick on that one here, because before the introduction of quantum physics to the metaphysical world perspective, we had the mysteries of the pituitary and the pineal glands. Things most people had never heard of before, things that became relevant truths of the inner workings of our connection with spirit and mysticism. Science had learned these glands had some principal responsibility for producing compounds that alter our mood and feelings. They push our emotional state by altering our body chemistry. Even today, for many people, these glands in particular are the keys to higher consciousness. There are numerous other glands providing a variety of chemicals that alter our mind, but these were the first and the most obvious, and so they remain in a place of honor for the spiritual and mystical pursuits. It takes at least a little bit of self-discipline to take the reins back with a flood of mind-altering chemicals from these primitive brains to think before you act. More sophisticated practitioners of these dark arts will program you to reject attempts to help you think for yourself. It doesn't matter if the origin of these ideas is from a cult or an advertiser. They want you to follow them without thinking. They want a completely loyal customer who will not be persuaded by simple challenges to your state of mind. Some people externalize these sensations, attributing them to spirit guides influencing their emotional state as a kind of a message from the mystical world. Or they'll attribute them to ghosts or demons or other external stimulus. The sensations can be quite intense for people who allow these sensations to guide them more than the cognitive parts of their brain. Is it possible these actually do form a link to mysterious spiritual forces? If so, then that link is not capable of complex information, not real communication. It could only influence broad-scale emotional states and influence your feelings. But there is much more to explore first. Some of the most insidious biases we all bring to the table are programmed into those more primal brains. It is something you should learn to recognize for what it is, presuming you want to have better control over yourself. Some may think the next few minutes are leaning towards some kind of political commentary, and you should examine that thinking carefully if you do. If anything, however, it's a commentary on our society, and it's learning to deal with the more practical knowledge of how the more primitive parts of the brain work, and how to exploit them. These are not religious or political comments. They are observations that elements within our brain are being exploited for both commercial and ideological purposes. Regardless of your being wealthy or wanting, progressive or conservative, liberal or authoritarian, people are exploiting these weaknesses in your brain to manipulate your thinking. They want you to buy things. They want you to buy ideas. They want to make you like certain things or certain people. They want to separate you from some portion of your wealth. If an advertiser or a campaigner or a social media influencer can get that chemo-emotional reaction going, there's a very good chance that you will be drawn into their presentation. Their goal is to program the more cognitive brain to surrender to those chemo-emotional sensations they used to get your attention in the first place. They will use simple phrases and images to trigger you and get your attention. Given the time and opportunity, they will program the intellectual elements of the brain with more in-depth presentations that reinforce that chemo-emotional state of mind they want. With enough time and exposure, Deeper programming will set in, you will no longer need to hear the whole story, and the simple images and phrase will manipulate your emotional state quickly and subtly, and your more cognitive brain will no longer interfere 
It'll just go along for the ride. In short, you'll stop thinking and just follow, or contribute, or buy. Words are, in my not-so-humble opinion, our most inexhaustible source of magic, capable of both inflicting injury and remedying it. The most insidious biases we bring to the table are those we no longer even think about. The religious and social background we have will define the hue and tint with which we observe the world around us. Unless we have learned to use our more cognitive brain as a gateway to how we program our own visceral reactions, we can be easily triggered by some simple images and phrases to alter our moods and manipulate our emotional state. You may be feeling those chemo-emotional sensations right now, after discussing these things that I've already brought up. Consider who has programmed those responses in you, and why they did it. And consider why these thoughts should be potentially threatening. When we allow the chemical brains to drive the cognitive brain, we become susceptible to intellectual shortcuts that begin to dull our capacity for cognition. We ride the quick and simple chemo-emotional sensations rather than considering the situation with greater care. We have explored a bit of how the primitive parts of the brain can be exploited to hijack the more cognitive parts of the brain, to dull our cognitive skills and influence our decision process. We know this is not limited to things we have been exposed to recently, but they can reach back to our earliest upbringing. The moods and sensations from these primal parts of the brain can override our intellect if we do not maintain a level of intellectual discipline. While we know that even the more cognitive brain can be influenced, we still have no clear pathways for mystical influences to affect us in sophisticated ways, just broadly emotional ways. But there are more direct ways to influence these primal elements within the brain. Bringing questions to the thinking, these are actually links to the spiritual and the mystical world. Several decades ago, studies were made to try to measure if we exist beyond the body and the brain. Every new technology to measure such things gets rolled into a new set of tests to explore this. In an all too abbreviated summary, let me examine several methods we measure activity in the brain and several ways to affect it. One series of studies, I recall, observed someone going into deep meditation to reach an altered state of consciousness. Their brain was monitored electrically with an electroencephalograph, an EEG, as well as the chemistry of the brain being monitored by way of blood tests. In deep meditation, the brain presented different electrical patterns from normal consciousness, and the brain set different chemicals into the body. But here's the interesting thing. When they electrically stimulate the brain with the same patterns, they measure the same chemicals in the body, and the subject reports entering the same state of consciousness they have previously achieved through meditation. Just as interesting, if the chemicals present are introduced into the body, then the electrical activity of the brain changes as well, and the subject also reports entering the same state of consciousness again. So the electrical and the chemical activity from the brain do not just reflect the state of the brain, they also influence each other, blurring any potential clarity into how any external influence might be observed. The electrical and chemical activity from the brain can also be affected to some extent by sound and even by light. Sending two frequencies of sound, one into each ear, or flashing lights at two different frequencies, one into each eye, the brain will begin to reflect the beat of these different frequencies if that beat is within the range of signals the brain can normally generate. And the state of consciousness can be altered in this manner as well. This is called hemispheric synchronization, and it can be used to help people meditate or focus their attention more clearly. But it cannot induce complex concepts. It cannot teach, or communicate, though it can influence the chemo-emotional states of mind. More recent studies experimenting with the direct taps into neurological signaling as people try to interface more directly with their electronics 
have revealed an interesting and very relevant point. Each of us is wired differently. One explanation speculates that nerves are connected arbitrarily as the body develops, so it is unpredictable exactly how extremities are physically wired into the nervous system and the brain. When we are in miles of wire and tubing to make an airliner work, the wires are laid out in the same places. There is variation within the structure of the bundles, but we know how to connect them together because of the colors we use to identify them or the shapes of connectors that we build onto the ends of the wires. Oh, to be sure, in the body, the major nerve bundles all serve the same regions in the body, but the specific connections develop on the fly, and they're never really repeated from one person to the next. Similarly, regions of the brain perform the same general tasks, but the wiring into them and the wiring of them varies on the small scale. An example of this would be the different responses of patients undergoing brain surgery. Instruments brushing part of the brain in one patient may evoke a different response in another patient. So even with the same stimulation, different people will respond differently in neurological terms. To me, this calls into question certain go-to explanations for paranormal observations, such as mass hallucination. While pharmacology can influence a similar state of consciousness in people, the details of the experience are generally going to be different, yet they can be steered through communication to an agreed common point. Exposure to an electromagnetic flux, however, would be unlikely to stimulate two brains in the same way. Even if the flux was very smooth and each person stood in the same orientation immediately next to each other, it would be akin to a surgeon brushing the same part of the brain in two different patients. Exposed to poor house wiring, for example, people who report an effect will generally report a sense of paranoia or fear. But to different degrees and with other symptoms like hallucination varying widely. This suggests that part of the symptoms play out by altering the state of consciousness by general electrical stimulation, while other symptoms play out with the specific wiring of the individual. This seems to suggest that the shared experiences are more cognitive in nature, that they can be aligned by communication between people making the observation, arriving to an agreed point, or if different people actually observe the same external phenomena. We know we're susceptible to electromagnetic flux, and yes, people refer to field or frequency or several other F-words here. Flux is the proper term because flux describes the energy interfacing through a surface, such as the surface of the folds of your brain, which is where the real fun takes place. This particular effect could be from directly induced electrical currents on the surface of the brain, or it could be through interference with synaptic transmission. In order to accept the possibility of an external influence, we must identify a method to affect the brain other than what we've already discussed because so far we need a person meditating to alter their state of consciousness or their perceptions, or we need electrodes around their brain to stimulate it, or we need to make pharmacological changes. People tend to notice a net of electrodes wrapped around their skull or an array of needles in their skin. We need something less intrusive. Furthermore, the broad and general effects of electrochemical stimulation do not provide a path for any form of sophisticated information. Communication cannot happen, just mood-altering effects. Fortunately, or maybe not, there is one path that might just happen to exist. The synapse is an electrochemical junction in the nervous system. It's a fascinating structure if you bother to look at it in more detail. There is a gap, a barrier in this structure that a signal has to travel across in order to be transmitted. It is in several ways like a transistor amplifier. It is also subject to chemical and electromagnetic interference. And it just might be subject to the same sort of noise 
and interference that some paranormal technology devices are subject to. Now think about that carefully for a few seconds. There is a portion of the nervous system that may be subject to the same kind of interference that are used in ghost hunting tech. In other words, regardless of the cause of those effects detected by ghost hunting technology, whether they're mystical or mundane, our nervous system may be susceptible to the same kind of effect. And if those devices measure an effect, it may have an effect in our brain as well. Now, we cannot say this with certainty because no one really understands what we're measuring there. If we did understand it well, it would no longer be paranormal. We know how to do it. We know how to get the noise out of the box and record it. But we don't really know what it represents. There are certainly times it seems to be beyond the scope of coincidence. One of the biggest problems with this kind of technology is that we lack good negative control tests to understand the much simpler role of cognitive bias and cognitive priming in the same situations. Without the understanding for a formula to measure things separately, the crucible remains empty as we try to reduce these observations to clear and concise concepts. But that seems to be about it, the one path that just might leave us open to influences we do not yet know how to measure or quantify. Yet it leaves a path for highly sophisticated ways to affect us. Why should we learn skills like critical thinking and rationalism? Just minutes before Perseverance rover landed on Mars, I recorded this answer. Well, science is the language of nature and learning about science and learning how to think like a scientist means you are learning how to systematically seek out truth in the world. You are learning the scientific method. You're learning how to be a critical thinker. And honestly, those skills are great for whatever you end up wanting to do in life. As I said before, Carl Sagan used to point out that science is not so much a body of knowledge as it is a way of thinking. The vulnerability of our brains is the reason we need skills like critical thinking and rationalism. Even with these skills, we can be fooled by what we think, by what we want to believe, what recently happened, our mood, the people around us, even the state of the power grid. Methods we have developed with science help us to learn how the world around us works. They help us to burn through misleading truths. We can discard the political truths handed down as policy, and the personal truths we choose to believe. They help us to burn away the irrelevancies and get to the objective truth of things, truth that is independent of belief or of policy. Variations of Carl Sagan's baloney detection kit help us to question not just the ideas of others, but our own ideas before we bother others with them. To show how medicine works, we test some patients with the medicine, and we test others with placebo. To do this ethically, we make sure that neither the doctor nor the patient knows if the medicine is real. The expectation is that the placebo will have no effect. From personal experience in participating in an experimental therapy, I can assure you that placebo does not provide relief. I dropped out of the test after two weeks of extreme discomfort, and it was verified I was on the placebo. I then got a drug that actually works, and it worked within an hour. Testing observational science, the subject of upcoming content, we must also test the observers and use multiple observers to have confidence in the results. To avoid bias in these studies, observers from different groups should not communicate much during the study. This is a matter of discipline, and it must not be considered an exclusion. After the study, all observers will collaborate strongly with their data. Observations can be subjective. A clear and precise protocol needs to be used to record subjective observations such that others can grasp the descriptions, and an artist can draw it. With all these vulnerabilities known, with all the vectors to interfere with our perceptions, with all our willingness to just believe things that are probably not real. Why cling to the idea that things such as angels and demons or other entities might exist? 
It does, after all, require a somewhat larger closet to keep track of these things in. Well, there do seem to be patterns to some kind of phenomena. I will pursue this in more detail when I begin to examine paranormal phenomena more closely. When an individual has a strange experience, well, that can be dismissed. When many others independently describe the same kind of experience, it may indicate a pattern. When multiple people experience the same strange phenomena together, well, that may be the old favorite mass hallucination. However, does it make sense that several people with different beliefs and different background would hallucinate the same thing? Could it possibly make sense that, instead, they actually experienced some common external influence? Is it the first go-to when strange phenomena are experienced? No. There are other things we already know about to be ruled out first. But then things might be permitted to get interesting. Actually, it's fascinating enough when you realize all the things our brains can do without the need for any external influences. So understanding them has a great deal of value anyway. Lastly, externalizing influences on human behavior is comforting. It's not an excuse so much as it is a projection that some external influence is at least partially responsible for things that we do not understand. We have observed that the brain is vulnerable to biases caused by our own intellectual background and by chemical and electrical interference. Of these, the most subtle are internal biases induced by our own thinking. We know the brain will defend its position as arbiter of your reality, as described in my second essay. And we know that we can alter states of consciousness by meditation, but can also induce changes by electrical and chemical stimulation, but these are limited in terms of detailed information. We have also identified a potential weakness to the same sorts of interference that seems to manifest from time to time in various ghost hunting technology. This leaves at least one path we can identify that may leave us open to external influences we cannot currently measure or identify. We measure an influence in the brain for everything we perceive, so far as we can tell. So, if we are more than just a brain and a body, then our connection to the brain is rather strong. With the specific wiring of each brain being different, it is also a deeply individual connection. Even with the influence of known factors, we remain largely in control. We do not see much room for external control, only our perceptions of someone or something that may try to influence us. From the standpoint of science, we cannot explain one unknown with another. The known vulnerabilities are enough to explain perceptions for just about everything. The fringes of this understanding are hard to repeat on demand, therefore hard to observe and define, therefore hard to test and reproduce. The fact is, though, there is the potential for unknown external influences in our perceptions. In future content, I will explore some potential evidence of an influence consciousness may present locally, not only in space, but also locally, independent across time. I don't believe this is a direct influence, or rather it is not a direct influence that was measured. The influence measured was not strong in general. Still, the possibility of seeing some level of influence across time is profound. But can it convey information? While it is perilous to project our strange experiences we do not understand onto external sources we do not understand, it can be comforting to have some other direction to point. There are also apparent patterns in independent experiences of strange phenomena by people with different backgrounds. Different backgrounds might not imagine the same experience, so these patterns could potentially be evidence of an actual external influence. If we can determine how to filter out the various biases that we know about. In future content, I will explore how we might look at metaphysical and spiritual external influences. 
For the immediate future, we will stick to more rigid forms of observational science and how to reduce the influence of human vulnerabilities in its results. I am the Curious Cryptid, and next we will look at how different elements of our society deal with the evaluation of evidence and its incorporation into a body of knowledge. And so, just three miles short of uh, US-2, my uh, journey got interrupted. That object on the road was a cat that had been hit some minutes earlier. It was sitting up and watching cars drive over it. Um, the car behind me also pulled out. They got the cat off the road while I blocked traffic for a few moments. The other car uh, found a veterinary hospital that would take the cat in and care for it, and I interrupted my uh, collection of background roll to take the cat in to the vet. After a while, I resumed my uh, trip and the drive up to Skykomish, which I'll uh, share in some future content. It's now been about a month since all of that happened, the vet clinic has not been able to identify an owner for the animal. They have decided to call her Ruby, and there are a number of people who are interested in adopting her within the clinic. She's had one surgery so far, a osteectomy of the head of the femur, for the rear left, and that's actually something that cats can recover quite a bit from. In fact, she's been walking around on that for the last couple of weeks or so. Also, in the last couple of weeks, in spite of the avulsion of the front left limb, they're starting to see some motion and some sensitivity. She's undergoing a lot of physical therapy, and she's just become the darling of the vet clinic. She's doing really remarkably well, all things considered. Normally, cat and car meetings don't go so well. <laughs>